that's a very potent tool because of the amplitude and the timing of adrenaline that it creates. How have you come to think about the concept of productivity? So have you got any tools, any strategies, tactics that you use to kind of drop yourself into a productive state and stay there? Do all the things that I profess, morning sunlight, non-sleep deep rest if I didn't get enough sleep, um, physiological size when I need to bring my level of autonomic arousal, aka stress down. These are all things I've talked about. Um, three days a week of cardiovascular training, three days a week of resistance training, one day a week of deliberate cold, deliberate heat minimum, uh, usually on the day after leg day. Um, I do all that stuff and it creates a structure. And yes, it takes some time. And a lot of that stuff can be combined with consumption of podcasts and audiobooks at the same time and so social time. But for me, the process of writing, and I'm working on a book now, just the creative process has been greatly enhanced and productivity overall by setting in this 20 minute period where I force myself to just stop and have deliberate thoughts that are within a single context. I don't let my mind wander. I use handwritten sticky notes and I'll put the thing that I'm supposed to do and I'll keep looking at it because I'm amazed at how often my mind will flip to other things. So it's like, oh, I have to transfer some money to somebody that I owe them or I have to pay that bill or I have to, I mean, the number of excuses that leap to mind is outrageous for everybody, mm -hmm. unless we're under deadline, fear or extremely rare, but you know, high motivational states because we just simply love it. So I give myself five minutes or so to break into the work or five to 10 minutes. I don't expect full focus in that first five to 10 minutes, but here's what I tell myself. The feeling that I'm going to get after I complete something, having like really had to push against the grain to force my attention back to that thing, the feeling of having accomplished even a you know one hour bout of work is so incredibly rewarding for me. And the feeling of having done basically nothing is such an incredible sense of disappointment and lack of life, like such a like vitality drain for me. I know that it also enhances the social interactions I'll have. It's like a feeling of self-satisfaction that transcends to an ability to show up with more clarity of mind. I'm one of the, the problems for me in terms of productivity is I'm very strongly affiliative. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of close friends. So if I get a text message from someone, I feel compelled to write them back, not out of responsibility because if it's someone I'm close with, I love that person. Text coming is, isn't a distraction. Like that's the, that's the good stuff in life. That's one of the reasons I'm there. So I have this practice sometimes of imagining that my, um, my crew, they want me to like forage off to where I need to go and collect the gems and come up with the ideas that are going to be the next post, the next podcast, the next scientific study. They want that. I tell myself they want that for me. Like they're cheering me on because I know I'm cheering them on. Some are musicians, some do other things. Um, I'm cheering them on. I want them to know like I'm here and g I want you to go get the stuff and do your thing. And so I imagine that they're doing that for me and I turn my phones off and there's some anxiety in doing that. I'll put it in the car sometimes because it's not that I'm I need to neurotically check the phone because I don't feel safe if I don't hear from them. Like I love these people and I don't want them to feel as if I'm not available. That's really how it is for me. You know, if you're going to create anything of value in this life, well, you're going to have to be willing to, to be on your own for a bit, to forage on your own, to take walks alone, and then return to people, to your tribe, so to speak, and share with them what you've learned, or maybe even just show up with whatever energy shift has occurred while you were off. Procrastination is super interesting. There are actually some data that Adam Grant shared with me recently that people who procrastinate actually have, um, tend to be have access to certain creative states that non-procrastinators don't. The way to overcome procrastination is to do something harder than the hard thing that you're putting off. That's very clear. Do something harder. Don't go clean your, like suddenly if you want to do their, their taxes, clean their room, clean the garage, organize the gym, whatever, when they don't want to write a chapter in their book. But you have to pick something that's worse than writing the chapter in your book and do that for five minutes. That's the way that the the dopamine reward system works and some of these stress systems work. Um, what would be an example? Give me give me a tactical example of okay, this. Okay, I need to write a chapter on focus and, um, and tools for focus for my book. I'm finding I'm doing everything but doing that. I'll do anything but that. Okay, so then you have to find something worse than that. So for me, worse than that is anything involving a spreadsheet. Just the idea of a spreadsheet gives me hives. I would force myself to do five to 10 minutes of like establishing a spreadsheet of my expenses and taxes related to, I don't know, some segment of my work life. I mean, I can't think of anything worse in that moment that doesn't involve physical or psychological damage. 
So doing that, and then you'll see it will make writing that book chapter very accessible. It's a down, it's a downhill cruise from there. But people find themselves doing all these things that they would normally want to put off as a way to avoid doing the harder thing. So it's it's about understanding that what is difficult and what you want to put off or do is a dynamic hierarchy. Hmm. I think uh, you can think of it as dynamic subordination. The point being, do something harder than the thing you're trying to avoid. Now, some people really like deliberate cold exposure for that reason, because in a, and here I'm going to really, if I've taken heat for, no pun intended, for the deliberate cold exposure thing, now I'm really going to get behind it for the following reason. People who are really into exercise of various kinds, but not deliberate cold exposure, love to push back on people that do posts about deliberate cold exposure. Oh, that's not doing anything. It's not much metabolic lift. Okay. But let's really step back and be honest with ourselves. The adrenaline, the, 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 the pattern of adrenaline release over time from deliberate cold exposure is something that's very hard to recreate safely with other endeavors. You know, sure, a hard workout is gonna spike your adrenaline and dopamine also, but is it gonna spike it the way that deliberate cold exposure is? No. Also, the amount of a of a mental barrier that one has to get over in a moment, not, there's no like three warm up set. Show me the pre-cold plunge drink that makes it easier, okay? It's called willpower. Yeah. Okay. And now some people come to love deliberate cold exposure, but that's usually for how they feel afterwards. So I think there is so much utility to deliberate cold exposure. Now, do people have to do it? No, but deliberate cold shower, deliberate ice bath, deliberate cold plunge is a, is a world apart from all the other self-imposed stressors because of the speed of onset of the yeah. stress. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a very potent tool because of the amplitude and the timing of adrenaline that it creates.